Hello, everyone. We are now here for another episode on uh, Kevin Marcus podcast. And with us today, we have a very interesting individual, uh, Ms. Victoria Bokum Bentley. Uh, Berkeley, sorry, she is the CEO of Riches of the Earth Organic Farm. And uh, she is originally, well, she was originally from Washington, D.C., but she moved to St. Kitts and Nevis in 2003. She is going to tell us the journey uh, moving from uh, uh, moving from the, the state of D.C. to uh, the Caribbean and the cultural differences and why she made her move. Uh, she also she also uh, said that she, is, she was captivated by the Caribbean and it was a lifelong dream to to move and live here. So without further ado, we have a lot more to discuss about her. Uh, she she started a small business in, in selling disposable uh, medical supplies uh, and medical equipment to the medical industry. So she is a, a woman of many hats, and we know that we tend to elevate uh, elevate uh, women of that degree to 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 the pedestal that they, that they require to be on. So without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce our guest for this uh, interview, Miss Victoria. Hello, Miss Victoria. How are you? Good evening. I'm doing very well. Thank you. And how are you? I am doing great. It's nice to have you on here. You sound very energetic. How was your day? It was great. You know, uh, I really like that. I have so many projects or different projects that I'm in engaged in and it keeps my mind sharp and you know so I I, I very seldom have downtime I'm always busy so I, I don't have anything to complain about really all right great stuff so that's a that's a great point to start when you say that you, you, you you're very busy that means you have things tending to so what are what is the most important, well, the most, in, not just most important, but most valuable to you right now as, as an individual at that point in your life? What are you tending to that, that you find that is necessary and very important that you tend to it? Well, I think that, you know, I believe in this, uh, the motto that your health is your wealth, right? And I know that since moving here to the Caribbean, I've been really blessed to have met my husband, who's an herbalist, and he has helped me regain my health. When I first moved here from Washington, D.C., although I still had businesses and I was still very ambitious and, you know, I engaged in a lot of different things, I did have a lot of health pro uh, health problems, right? So um, after after two other businesses that I started, well, the first one, as you said, you mentioned the um, uh, selling the disposable medical uh, supplies and medical equipment. At that point, I wanted to be a major dis distributor to sell health products or medical products to the Caribbean. So I did travel. I traveled to uh, Dominica, Antigua, the Dominican Republic, uh, Trinidad to get clients for my uh, business, which was at the time called Victorium Imports. But God had placed it on my mind and in my heart to start working with at-risk youth in Bastere. Now, to be honest, I did not come here. I did not move to the Caribbean, which was a lifelong dream to start working with at-risk youth. So mm -hmm. I did kind of rebel a little against that, but then other circumstances happened, which made me change my mind. And I started a program called the Community Achievers Project. And it started in my little apartment, bringing in one student, trying to teach him how to read. Mm -hmm. However, he had a serious learning disability and I was not really academically uh, equipped to deal with the type of issues that he had, but I made sure that I cooked for him. And so he brought other children and next thing you know, I had like 12 children come into my apartment and um, they were teaching me how to uh, the cook Caribbean style. 
because, you know, as I said, I came here from uh, Washington, D.C., so I didn't really know how to cook a lot of the Caribbean dishes, and so the children would teach me, but it got too large for my apartment, so I went to the deputy, uh, the deputy, uh, who is it? Sam Conder was the deputy prime minister at the time and asked him if he could provide another facility for me because uh, this pro project had outgrown my apartment. So then we started at the community center, but then that wasn't adequate either because I found that a lot of the children had were either academically or socially uh, challenged. And so I needed places where they would be able to sit down at a desk and, uh, and to work. And so uh, I started working in the elementaries or primary schools, as you call them here. And I was very, very fortunate because although I did not have a background in early childhood development or anything like that, I was able to get a lot of uh, volunteers of Peace Corps, uh, expats, um, uh, ECCB, the Rotary Club. Uh, and then uh, we have several medical universities here. So I got the fal the stat the faculty and students to also volunteer in my program, and we did literacy programs like um, homework assistance, and then I had the cap reading program, and then I had nutritional programs, and we graduated from just dealing with primary schools to dealing with the um, with two high schools. So it got really successful and it was really large. And, but I knew at the time that I still needed a vocational skills for some of the youth who were not going to be able to pass the, what is that, the CXCs or what, what the exams that they would have to take when they got into high school. So uh, I met my husband who uh, who was an organic farmer and as I said, an herbalist. And I had, well, he wasn't my husband at the time, but I asked him if I could bring my children to his farm and would he teach them organic agriculture? And he said, yes. Now he had no idea what kind of children I was talking about. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I brought the children up and, uh, we had over like 300 children that we taught them agri uh, organic agriculture and agro processing to add value to our crops. Now, at the same time, I was also learning as well because I'm from Washington, D.C. I didn't do any farming, knew nothing about it. But at this time, the soil was so fertile. All you had to do is drop a seed and things would grow. And I was like, yeah, I'm a farmer too, you know? Because <laughs> <laughs> it was just so simple at that time, right? And so um, we did this from 2004 until 2016. And at this time, I was writing proposals and I got funding from UNICEF and USAID and the State Department and Canary and the Taiwanese came in and helped us. I mean, it was just like, we were just really blessed to have uh, funding and also volunteers. But then what happened, um, as I was getting older at this point and um, the farm was, kind of being neglected because my husband was so busy with the children that he wasn't really able to take care of the farm properly. And so we decided that it was time for us to uh, end the program because we weren't getting funded either. And I was making, we were paying for all of the uh, everything. Like, you know, we had to have transportation to get the children to the farm. We also had to make sure that we had we fed them, 
and I had to make sure we had people to help us and we had to pay for that as well. So it was be kind of, it got very expensive. And at this point, it was time for us to start really thinking about ourselves because we were getting older. And yeah. so then we started uh, really focusing on riches of the earth, organic farm. Now, let me say that when I came here, as I said, I had health problems, but I wasn't really addressing any of those problems. But then after we, well, not, no, actually, I think around hmm, 2012 or so, my husband started me on this regimen of drinking these different bush teas. Now, it was in America, I spent tons of money uh, uh, in a place called Whole Food, where they sold all kind of uh, health products. But it, they never, never did what these herbs did here in St. Kitts and Nevis. It just didn't come close. <laughs> and at the time, I had a problem with my liver. I really had a damaged liver. It wasn't a fatty liver. It was a damaged liver. And I had all of these fibroids. And it was I was in, I was in bad shape. And by drinking these herbs, which I didn't like some of them, like the neem and uh, some of the stuff, boy, it was so bitter. I was like, oh, my goodness. But I drank it, whatever he told me to do. I was drinking it. And then when I went to the United States in 2014 to have a complete physical. My liver had become completely regenerated. I mean, whole, it was back to normal. It was wow. like, wow, this is a miracle. And all of my fibroids were gone and I had no depression. Oh, just, I was like a different person. And I was like, you know what? We're going to sell these products. We're going to start selling these products, Sydney, because people need to know about it, especially in the uh, the United States, because, you know, we just didn't have some of these herbs that we have here. And uh, so, but I think up until 2016, we really did not devote a lot of time doing that. But after 2016, that's when we started uh, really making these different products using the crops that we grow because we are organic and it was very important to us that we provided our clients with quality products. And so we know that whatever that we sold, that it was good stuff because my husband does goes to the extreme to keep his farm, even where he's still pulling weeds, which is why now, right now, he's convalescing because pulling them weeds hurt his knees. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, but we know for a fact that our products are very good. And so that's why now you was asking me about today, what was so important. Well, I am now, we have so many products that people are, really coming back up to us and said, look, we need more of these uh, people who had kidney stones, the products took those away, prostate problems for the men, uh, come fertility problems for the women, uh, erectile dysfunction for the men, mood, mood changes for women, uh, to detox, uh, uh, if you had uh, acid reflux, because what happened, a lot of these herbs and things, what happened now, I decided that in addition to the teas, we needed to be able to get these herbs into the bloodstream quicker than just the teas could do. So we started you uh, uh, making tinctures and uh, glycerites using either uh, extracting the herbs in alcohol or glycerin right? Depending on whoever needed it, because some people can't handle alcohol at all. Although when you extract these herbs with alcohol, it has a shelf life of up to 10 years. Wow. It, it extracts like 85 to 95% of the benefits of the herb, but some people still can't handle it. 
Although if you use, if you uh, leave it in your tea for like 15 minutes, it evaporates a lot of that alcohol so you don't taste it anymore. And so you're really getting the full uh, benefit of the herb. But then, as I said, there's some people who just don't want it. So we also do it in glycerin. Now, the glycerin doesn't extract uh, as much of the benefits as the alcohol, but it's still very effective. And so we started doing that. And as, uh, as I said, well, we have all these people coming back to us saying, look, this is some good stuff. I told my friend about it. And uh, it worked. And so now we want you to tell, uh, you know, if my other friend knows about it or my family member knows about it. And so now we have decided that we are now concentrating on the Nooni. And a lot of people don't like that Nooni because it stinks. And I know it because I never have tried the Nooni juice that fermented once stuff because I just never could tolerate the smell of it. But yeah, yeah. what uh, we do one go thing, ahead. Yeah. Oh uh, one thing I want to uh just backtrack and this is very it's very interesting. But uh just to recap some of the things that you said to to capture some interesting interesting parts of it is that you started off in Washington, D.C. You, you, you grew up in Washington, D.C.? Is that, is that correct? Yes, yes. And, and, yeah. and, and what was your life like growing up in Washington, D.C.? Were you, were you pursuing academics? Were you pursuing a uh, health degree? Were you pursuing an economic degree? Or, 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 or what, 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 no. what, what were you no. pursuing? <laughs> I was just, yeah, it seemed like I was a jack, a jack of many trades. Um, actually, I used to be a research analyst, the only Black research analyst for a company called SRI, the, uh, the, um, the, uh, uh, the East, the, the uh, facility that was located on the East Coast. And a research uh, analyst. Yes, a research analyst. I was the only black research analyst in oh, the East wow. Coast office. Yeah. Uh, as I say, I, I really did strive to reach the moon. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So so when you were a, a research analyst, uh, you 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 got some uh information or or data that uh health is something that you could move into to make a, a difference. Is that's why you were selling uh, medical products in the Caribbean? How, how did you transfer from, uh, from a, a research analyst to a, a company, only black <laughs> research analyst to a company, and then being able to come up with that business idea to sell medical, medical uh, 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 disposable medical uh, uh, items to the Caribbean? How did, how did that transition happen? How did well, what happened, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I was really, really blessed and um where i was living as a child and um we had both uh like black people chinese and white folks in our community so i grew up with them so i was never afraid of uh, of anybody because i grew up with them right now in uh america though at that time it was still is very racist very very racist right but fortunately where i grew up i didn't really experience that too much so it always showed me how i could think i was always able to think and you know look around and see what was needed and see if i could do something you know and so that's how i became the research analyst because they were telling me no 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 all you have is a bachelor's degree and it's from a community college uh, that all you can be is a research assistant. Because look, we got black people here who got master's degrees and they still research assistants. And so uh, we're not gonna allow you to do that. And so they had, I was in a um, my interview for seven long hours, but I was so prepared because I had my short-term goals, my long-term goals, I had everything. And so after uh, seven hours, seven hours, the, uh, the, um, he was the manager of that particular org that I was, I was 
going to be working in. And he said, well, congratulations. You are a research analyst. But he said, I want you to know it's not going to be easy for you because there's going to be a lot of people who are very upset because you are a research analyst. And he was, it was true. I mean, I used to get hate mails. They uh, stole, would steal my check. They would call me and all kind of stuff, you know, and I was like, what, what's wrong with these people? But and, that didn't deter me. And how did but, you, yeah, yeah. And how did you, and how did you deal with that in the moment when you saw, and one thing before we get to that, there's something that you, I want to point out is that you said you, you had, they, they taught you how to think. Who was the day that taught you how to think? And what does that thinking look like? Well, I think because what happened, I had people with me from different walks of life and they were different. Uh, my Chinese were first generation Chinese. Their parents came from China and they were very prejudiced. They didn't really like black people. They, you know, in fact, it was interesting. A lot of black pe uh, people who came to America when they were get they would get indoctrinated into or uh when they first got into america the first per people they told to avoid and look down upon was black americans so uh, even africans that i met they were the same way you know they were taught that we were shiftless and lazy and all kind of crap you know so I grew up knowing that some of these parents of my friends that they were prejudiced, but uh, I were able. I was always able to overcome that. I I don't know. Well, I think it was my so, grandmother. So, so, so one, one, yeah, yeah. One or two things is so fascinating. So fascinating to 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 hear your story. So one or two things is that you met the first generation. Chinese. And yes. you said that being around them, you uh, learned the ability to think and they were a bit prejudiced in some sense. Uh, can, and, and, and that's one of the things, there's this idea, there's this idea that the social class is created, engineered in some sense based on the 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 way that our people are uh, or the way that people are educated in some sense it's like it's like it's, it's like a it's like a, a hierarchical model where uh the the persons that are first generation in some sense that are at the top of their hierarchy they receive a different level of education and that level of education they they go to the ivy league schools in some sense so they teach them a, some, they teach them so, what they teach them basically is how to interpret and how to see the world, how to think in some sense. And and as a uh, and, and, and and this educational psychologist that I I I am very fascinated in, Je Piaget and and Je Piaget was talking about the, the different games that you teach people to play based on where they are in life. So when you said you met first generation people Chinese in some sense, and you associate meeting them with a different ability to think and we understand that poverty and, 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 and slavery and all of the the low level behaviors that that is associated with uh, different races tend to come from uh, our our lack of ability to think or our perception of the world they probably sell the sort of false perception so that we cannot to some sense that you cannot break past a certain barrier. You will always be, no matter what you do, the way you perceive the world, the way you think in itself is your deterrence to a better life. And, 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 and partly some of that is giving up your responsibility to something you believe that is higher than you, whether it's the government, whether it is something that is unseen. But, but a lot of us, a lot of persons that are below in the social hierarchy in some sense and they do not have the ability to move forward up social mobility when you speak to them they always it's always the government have to do something for me this mm -hmm. person have to do something for me a level of personal responsibility and a level of creativity like you associated with your thinking because of the persons that you were around you decide to step forward into the unknown and come up with creative ideas to move forward is that a fair analysis? 
Absolutely, absolutely, which prepared me to when I moved here, remember, because I moved to the Caribbean, I moved, I moved to St. Kitts and Nevis on my own. I did know uh, one family, but I mean, they weren't family or anything. I moved here on my own, just like when I was uh, 19, I went to Jamaica on my own. And I loved it. I really loved it. I loved it that it had ocean and mountain. And I said to God, I told God then, I was like, look, I want to live in a country where it's mo it's, um, I want the mountain, I want the ocean, and I want a roster too. Now that's strange because in America, I didn't know no rosters. No roster was in Washington, D.C. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, it, it didn't happen. It took like, what? I was 19 when I went to Jamaica. I was 50 when I moved to St. Kitts and Nevis. So it took a long time. And I didn't meet my husband until, uh, what, 2007. So um, it took a long time. But to get back to what you're saying, the way, I mean, I could always think, I mean, you know, being around people who look different than me, even though we loved each other, but we know that we did come from different classes. We did because they had been indoctrinated and in thinking that they were better than us, right? And um, I never thought that any of them were better than me. Now, even though they, the, the racism did still exist because during high school, I went to a different high school than they went to. They, went, they were able, they were bust into another zone completely, which was predominantly white area. And I went to a black high school, right? Because of, you know, I'm black. But um, so I always, I was always conscious that boy, they always trying to do something to keep us back. They always doing something to keep us back, right? So I was always conscious of that, but I never was gonna let it stop me from achieving my goals or what I needed to do. Okay, because but that's, like, the, for, that's the that, that's that's the that's the that's the that's the great point here. Sorry for interjecting because I just want to stick a pin. And no matter what you do in life, there are many situations that are going to try to keep you back. So you know there are so many people, even when even they were in your shoes in some sense, and they find a little uh, hiccup that might uh, keep them back. Some some prejudice, some 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 racism, some this you know, they fall back into the basement and they say, well, the world out there is terrible. There is racism and I couldn't achieve anything because they want to hold me back. But, uh, but here is your story. Your story is a testament in some sense that when you have the free will that, and, 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 and then the ability that God put inside of you, there's nothing that can hold you back but yourself. Nothing. I'm telling you the truth. That is the God's honest truth. Because when I got here, as I said, uh, you asked me, did me going to being a research analyst have anything to do with me selling the equipment and things yeah, like that? Yeah, it yeah. had. It, it did not have anything to do with that. In fact, what happened after I left SRI, my immediate boss had started another company and uh, he wanted me and he hired me as his vice president, one of his vice presidents, right? And he was, uh, let me see, a PhD in nuclear physics, physics. That's how he, and we had this, um, we had won this contract with the US Postal Service and the uh, contract manager was a Chinese. Um, and that, and that both of them, they just loved me because I could think, you know, even though I didn't have all the, their degrees or any of that stuff, I could think. And in fact, the Chinese asked me, he wanted me to uh, leave the company and work with him to sell uh, uh, scrap metal to China. But something in the back of my head was saying, no, 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 no. Uh-uh, I don't know. I ain't trusting this. Um, <laughs> hmm. I wonder what they what that scrap metal going to end up doing. And so I didn't do it. Now, there are times, too, that 
I just stepped back. I didn't just do things for money. I never did things just for money. Oh, okay, okay, it. okay. Let, let me, let me, let me, let me press you on that. Thank you very much for saying that. So, so, but you, you uh, um, thank you very much for saying that. You don't always do things for money. So, there's this idea, especially biblical idea, right? Um, I I try my best to read a, as a young person to read and understand the Bible to the degree that me I can. Too. I know yeah. that. I know that I'm very ignorant in things of the Bible. The Bible is a very deep book. It's a very symbolic book. I don't want to sound like I know any of the things that I'm talking about. That's just what uh, I, I, I probably perceive. But, but there's this idea that I'm wrestling with at this current time when the, the, the devil, well, Satan himself took Christ in the wilderness and he, he tempted him. And he tempted him in three temptations when he asked him to turn the, the stone into bread because Christ was fasting. He was hungry, so he tested his flesh. Uh, basically, you can analyze that to from where I'm speaking as is the the will to the will to pleasure, the will to satiation, the will to 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 feed the flesh in some sense. Because hunger has a direct correlation with the flesh. When you're hungry, is the flesh that you want to feed? Is your belly, your stomach? It's not a, a higher order. It's not a higher order ability. It's, it's not a higher order need. It's a, it's a lower need. And uh, uh, this um, um, psychologist, um, um, Maslow, talk about the hierarchy of needs and the lowest need of man is the need to, to feed himself. So I look at it as that. But then when, when Christ overcame that temptation, he now went uh, to, brought him on top of the mountain and he said, um, I can give you all the land over here. Just bow down to me. And I think he was... And, and power that's that's that's, uh, that's analyzed as power so power is in the mind so when you move from the flesh because human beings exist in three planes the physical the mental and the spiritual so he went to the mental to the mind to say okay there is power power is your 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 your, your, your ability to to do what you want it's a it's a it's an ego it's an ego trip in your mind you're better than all the persons you are you all, all things are yours but then Christ said, no, all things are my father's, so there's no need for me to own anything. So Christ, again, he, he, he destroyed that the will, to, the will to power. And then he went to again and he said, yeah, uh, throw yourself over the tower and let's see if, if, if your father in heaven will save you. And Christ then again said, and that's the attack on personal responsibility, on free will. But Christ said, no, why, why do I tempt the Lord when I have the free will to not throw myself? I would have the ability to not, I, I don't want to tempt the Lord to come down and save me. And then we can analyze, well, I understand that human beings have the free, the, the free will, the will to pleasure, the will to power, and the will to meaning. And when you said you don't do things only for money, uh, you have moved yourself past the will to, because persons get money for, for, for free reasons. Persons get money to have a good time, to have fun, to eat, to do all the basic needs, to, to, to do all the, the, the things of the flesh. But then persons then try to accumulate, uh, uh, accrue wealth so that they could have power, they could have more freedom over others. But then there is a, the one percenters of people in the world that think about money to do something meaningful for a higher aim. So when you said that you didn't always think about money, I'm going to ask you, what is it that you were thinking about if you were not thinking about doing things for money? Well, first of all, my grandmother was a very religious person and uh, she kept me really sheltered. And I rebelled. I really did rebel. I, for a number of years, I was on the wrong path. But even when I was on the wrong path, I always knew that there was limitations on how far I was going to go because I just believed what my grandmother had already it had just been preaching to me. But I was rebellious because she had kept me so, so I, I just wasn't smart, street smart at all. Right. So but what happened, I always believed in God. I always believed in the most high always believed in it and that's why i always had certain limitations on what i was going to do i don't care what type of situation i found myself in i was not going to do certain things because i believed in god i believed that he would take care of me because 
there were times, like I said, when I, um, when I did not accept certain things and he would still take care of me. Now, it, I may not have been able to achieve some of the, my goals that I really wanted to because there were strings attached to them and I just was not going to accept it. And so that meant then I had to go without. And I was, you know, I can. And that was the thing. I can. I can do without. I'm not, I'm, I, you know, I'm not here on my own. God is here. And when I need to know that, he always manifests himself. And that's how I started developing faith. And that's what happened here in, in St. Kitts and Nevis. When I was selling my disposable medical supplies and medical equipment, and God had been putting it on my mind to work with these children. And I was like, no, I ain't come here to do that. No. <laughs> and then what happened, you won't believe this. <laughs> I was expecting this big check from this the equipment I sold. And it, the check, you hear that saying about the check being in the mail. Well, it never materialized. The bank, the company went bankrupt. And here I was in St. Kitts, not knowing anybody. And now I ain't had no money. And I was like scared to death. And all I had was some, um, what happened, uh, some friends had stayed with me and they had bought groceries and they left. And at this time before then, now I was very wasteful. I wasn't eating a lot. I would go out and eat. At the end of the week, I had all these cartons of food I was throwing away. Now, here I was with no money, and uh, they had left some oatmeal, some sardines, I think a couple can of beans or something. And now, remember, this was six weeks that I went with no money, and I had just those little rations. On, and, and, oh, man, I lost weight, which was good. I looked good. I, I, did, did, I did look good. But... I didn't know anybody. So, I mean, I knew that's one family, but I wasn't going there begging them for food. So I was eating out of that. And I didn't even like sardines at that time, but I sure became to love sardines. I'm not lying to you. Necessity and so is the mother of all creativity. I tell you, I just, you know what? I was like, Lord, whatever you do, I would, if you want me to work with these children, I will do it. Just please make sure my money come back. What's going on here? Why ain't no money coming here? And you just got me eating this little uh, oatmeal. And I was rationing it because it wasn't a whole lot of food there, right? And this went for six weeks. But now, it never crossed my mind to be with some man or anybody to take care of me. It just never crossed my mind. All I knew is, well, I'm going to have to deal with this situation. And, and when God is ready, he's going to take care of me. And what that's what happened. After six weeks, he said, okay, you've learned your lesson. Now do be obedient to what I say. And that's when I started that program. And I'm going to tell you that uh, uh, the Community Achievers Project became huge, huge. People from uh, the uh, ambassador from the United States who was located in Barbados came here to meet us. The director of USAID, the international, uh, what's that? Uh, AID, uh, what's that? USAID. Yes, yes, they came here. The, the director here came here and uh, to meet us. Um, uh, the oh, even the uh, an ambassador from Jerusalem uh, had come here to meet with the prime minister, and he asked to meet with me in his uh, in the prime minister's private conference room because he had heard about our program. And he was saying that if, uh, and he was telling me how they had transformed Israel from a desert to a Mecca with all of the food that they were growing. And if they had a chance to come here 
that they would also come to uh, our farm and teach us how to do that, right? But evidently that fell through, that plan fell through because uh, I don't think the prime minister agreed with it, right? But anyway, what I'm saying is because I had the faith that God would provide and during the roughest time being in a foreign country, not knowing anybody I could depend on and and just and and living by faith, God just opened the door for me. I'm not telling you any lies. And then I met my husband and it just put it on a whole new different plane when it went from the literacy and nutritional to the agriculture. And that's where I learned all of these things too, because as I said, I didn't know anything about uh, turning peanuts into peanut butter. I didn't know about pumpkins and making pumpkin soup and all of this stuff. I didn't know any of that. So I I just learned how to do it. And, it, and, and now what I can, it, it's so wonderful because now I earn a living doing this. You know, this is what we do to earn a living. And people and more and more people are finding out about us because the products work and they turn in other people. Right now we have uh, uh, clients in Stacia and Stacia's always, oh man. And the testimonials that we get from the people in Stacia are just fantastic. And of course I got people in the United States. And so, you know, uh, God opened doors, but then, as I said, it was not with, I was not without going through some trials and tribulations and that's but, and that's that's part that's part that's part of the story in some sense and every there's there's this there's this uh, um, um um book that i read from uh, from from joseph campbell interesting it's called the hero's journey well based on your story we will have to coin it the hero in journey so basically he's talking about all stories that you find that's interesting is that somebody started well somewhere and where they were it wasn't where they had to be. They had to be supposed to move to somewhere better. And they had that feeling. They had that, that desire to want to become better than where they were. Not that where they were, it was bad. But And, and that's the story of maturation, biological growth. It's like you're born a child, but you have to grow up to be a teenager. But in the, the movement from a child to a teenager, you there are difficult things that, that you have to let go. You have to let go certain type of behaviors. You have to let go certain ways of seeing the world. And, and it's like a journey in some sense. And all stories that you read, all movies that you listen to, it has that fundamental appetite, that trope, that pattern where when you live somewhere comfortable and you try to strive to get to somewhere better, you have to fall in some sense into difficulty. And it's, 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 there's mm -hmm. a saying that goes like this. If you're moving from a, a bad place to a better place, you must go through a worse place. And it's, it's, it's symbolic of the, the, the children of Israel in some sense when they were moving from, from Pharaoh to the promised land. They had to stay mm -hmm. in, the, in the desert for some time. And it's had the yeah. same story with Abraham when he left his father's house and, he wanted, and when God wanted to give him the, the land, he had to go down to Egypt and he had to suffer famine. He had to suffer uh, a tyranny. He had to suffer all those things. And then God has to bring you down. When God wants to give you something, he needs to see he needs to make sure you see how the layman on the ground lives first before he can elevate you. If you cannot see how the layman on the ground lives first, when you get elevated to that level, you are unable to be empathetic to the smaller person on the ground. Yeah. So if you go on the ground and you're eating off the streets, and then he elevates you, see when somebody is eating off the streets, you might understand that it's, it's part of a journey and you might be, and that's where God can use you to elevate persons up out of the situation they are in. And it's all just, it's just, it's just beautiful how God works. Absolutely. And that is so true. The children, I would say, what you say, Sydney, maybe about 85% of the children that um, we helped uh, empower them. They are about 85% are doing really well. And I mean, some of these were ones who were going to be thrown away. And when I say, 
Well, yeah, that's what Sydney's saying that my husband talking about. When I say they were going to throw them away, you know, a lot of them, if you can't pass these CXC uh, exams in the school, uh, well, here, you are told to not even come back to, to fifth form. You have to go to, uh, if they have a vocational school, but a lot of the children don't even get there because uh, they're, you know, they've been passed around so long. They've not been uh, nurtured at all. They don't have the social skills in order to be able to handle situations. So a lot of them end up in the streets, you know, they become prostitutes and uh, gangsters, but we were very fortunate out of all of the children that we worked with, I think maybe, uh, it was only maybe about five or six of them went to jail. And I'm saying over, now when I say 300 people, children bringing them to the farm, that's not including the children that we work with in the primary schools too because we also went to the primary schools. And as I said, I had other literacy programs, but we also had agricultural programs in the schools as well, right? And the, a lot of those children didn't come to the farm. But when I see them now, I'm very proud to see that they have been elevated, that they're not in gangs and that they are earning, uh, uh, earning an honest living. And so that brings me a lot of joy, even though, you know, uh, sometimes I wonder, well, <laughs> they don't, <laughs> well, let me see what I'm saying. Okay, yes, I would like if more of them would have returned and said, oh, Victoria and Sydney, thank you so much. Well, that didn't happen. And I can understand how that happened as well because a lot of the home bringing, the, the upbringing, it did, and Sydney say the politics, it did not lend itself to teach them how to do that, right? But at the same time, I'm very happy that they're able to take care of themselves and not have to be joining gangs in order to survive. So yes, I do, because of my own experience, I have empathy for those who are less fortunate because I know how it is to be in a place where you don't have. So God knew that I had to go through these experiences in order for him. So when he was gonna elevate me, I wouldn't get there and then, you know, become vain. And, yep, yep. You know what I mean? So yeah, I do definitely understand what you were what you're saying. So yes. so so Victoria, um, last last question. We we could stay we could stay we could stay for a while, but uh, we we can do we can do this again and we can have the video if you if, if you would like because I I really enjoy your story and, and and speaking to you and I think more persons need to need need, need to hear you and, and I think you have a story to tell. I think you are able to change. Um, lies from with your story at this point. Your 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 purpose is not completed. As long as you're alive, your purpose is still is still is still there. And and and, and, and yes. God has God has some more work for you to do because he, he, yes. he still he still has you alive. And 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 your story can can really help elevate persons and to have persons to see the world in a different way, to see life differently, and to pursue life and not death and basically that's what you have been given to uh the, the children that you that was interested in your care so where you are right now what's what's we'll find my final question to you okay. where are you right now what are you pointing at what are you looking at what are you working on what are, what what is your what 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 valuable aim that you're pointing at with all the things that you're doing now Okay, as I said, right now, my major goal, my my real passion is health and wellness. It is because huh, I find that I, I when I moved here, I met people a hundred years old. They were looking so good. 
And now I'm seeing people dying at 40, 50 years old. They got diabetes, hypertension, uh, and they don't know anything about really about these natural herbs that these healing herbs, Ezekiel 47, 12 said that God made the fruit for meat and the leaf for medicine. Mm. However, this knowledge has not been passed down from the grandparents and the great grandparents to this present generation. So all they know about are pharmaceuticals. And unfortunately, many of these pharmaceuticals coming into the Caribbean are inferior. Some of them have even been banned from America. They have been, uh, right, uh, FDA has said, no, we're no longer going to be using these, yet they still coming into the Caribbean. So because of God, once again, my own experience is always my experience. I got to go through it. Seems like I always got to go through things before I can get to the other side and know what God's purpose is for me, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, now, because of my own illnesses and problems that I had, I'm now very much concerned about the health and the welfare of my brother, man, and sister here, right? Because, you know, there's no reason why so many of us are sick and they uh, are, are you taking all these pills that are causing other defects in the, or problems in your body. When we have natural medicine right here all around us. And this is where my um, experience as a research analyst comes in, because my husband being the herbalist, he is the one that introduced me to all these herbs because I didn't know about them. But at the same time, because we're dealing with the public, I want to make sure that the information that we're providing is accurate. And that's why I'm always conducting research on all of the products that we are creating. And right now we have two things that we're using and I'm just fascinated by them. And one, as I said, is the Nuni, and the other is the uh, prickly pear, the, the nopal, uh, the, 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 the pad of the prickly pear cactus. Now, I've been learning about all of the benefits that these two, uh, I guess that's a fruit. Yeah, the prickly pear is still a fruit, uh, are, can offer the body and as I said, once again, I always have to be going through something. Well, mine is a hypertension. And the reason being is because I just will not stop dealing with the salt. But now I'm finding out that the potassium, it's, yes, you might have to limit some of the salt, but you have to have salt in your body because you need that. But you don't like overextend it, right? But I'm learning that it's the potassium that's most important for those who have hypertension and other a lot of other kind of diseases, that potassium. And both the Nuni and the prickly pear have loads of potassium and magnesium and vitamin A and they're antiviral and anti fungal. I mean, even the seeds in the Nuni has such power to them, right? So now what we're doing is we're developing products using these two fruits that I know is going to bring, a, and, and what's interesting too, because with the Nuni, uh, whereas the Caribbean has kind of shunned the Nuni, in Hawaii, they praise the Nuni. They love the new. They know the power of the new. So here I am. We are now. We're also uh, learning more about this Nuni and how powerful it, it is. My husband makes a, a, a Nuni ointment for pain. And it's really amazing what it can do to relieve pain. And even when I had a, fung a fungus on my big toe, 
and I used that Nooni on it and it completely cleared my fungus off my toe now. I'm like, my goodness, this is some powerful stuff. So this is really where we are right now, trying to make sure that we can come up. Okay, my sister is telling me how in America, the price for uh, pharmaceuticals is getting more and more expensive. And even though she has a wonderful health insurance plan, and so do most of my family members and friends, Oh, in America, the price of pharmaceuticals, though, are getting more and more expensive, and they're trying to encourage them to do generics now, as opposed to the brand names, right? But it's so expensive some, that the insurance companies are saying, no, we don't want to pay for the brand name. You're going to have to pay, you're going to have to get the generic brand, right? And so now there are a lot of people rebelling because they want that brand name, but they can't afford it and their insurance isn't going to be paying for it. And so for me, that shows me a trend. Like, yes, you know what's going to happen after a while? Some people aren't going to be able to afford pharmaceuticals. And matter. then what's yeah. going to happen to them? Yeah. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. So. That's why we're now, God has got us on this other mission now to come up with these natural products that we have tested to show that, you know, when that happens, or actually before that happens, people will know that there's an alternative to get back to nature, yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah. That's what we're all about right now. Okay, great. Um, I think uh so so wonderful uh what you're doing and i would like to continue speaking with you i would yes. really uh appreciate you spending your time speaking with us and uh i think more people needs to hear your story and needs to be able to understand what it is that god has put in your heart to do and i think that you are able to reach a wide audience and me and my team, we are going to help you the best way that we can to be able to bring your story out there. You oh have my goodness. a wonderful story and my team, we are going to, we, when we get off the call, we can spend some time to speak because I have a consultancy for Apex Strategy. 4.21. That's what we do. We help a uh, uh, person to out there that that are living a genuine purpose because our organization is a, a a a social enterprise consultancy firm, and what it does it helps uh, uh small startups that have a genuine purpose and not only uh for for profit organization. It's it's a profit, but your profit must be achieved on. Uh, sustaining life, building life naturally and organically. So when we get off the call, we can get into some more deeper conversations on that. Yeah. But I really, I really, uh, this was a a, a God sent interview, and uh, let's continue the journey from strength to strength. I think. Oh it's yes. A good place to start. Thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to. Uh, converse with you and to share our story and we certainly look forward to uh, dialoguing with you further in the future thank you very much thank you thank you have a good evening